Okay, cool. Thanks everyone for joining um, this month's Grunfest Memorial Lecture. Um, so some beginning notes as always. The talk is from about 12 to 1 p.m. Um, and if you want to keep up with future talks in this series, you can visit the following website. Um, this lecture series is hosted in remembrance of Professor Warren S. Grunfest, who was a professor of many disciplines, including bioengineering, electrical engineering, and surgery at UCLA. Professor Grunfest was also a SPIE fellow in biophotonics and a strong advocate of junior scholars, which has inspired this lecture series focus on early career researchers in computational imaging and related fields. Um, I want to thank my co-organizers, Professor Chuda Kadambi at UCLA, Professor Katie Bauman at Caltech, and myself and Purdue Machari, who are PhD students at UCLA. And lastly, I want to thank the sponsor of this series, um, Akasha Imaging, which is a computational imaging startup on polarization. And like I mentioned before, um, Akasha sponsors an inverse honorarium so we can highlight work from PhD students and postdocs. And with the boring stuff out of the way, um, I'm excited uh, to introduce today's speaker, Sylvia Sellen, who is a PhD student at University of Toronto. Um, and among many accolades, Sylvia is a Vanier doctoral scholar and Adobe Research Fellow um, and the winner of the University of Toronto Dean's Doctoral Ex Excellence Scholarship. And she has previously worked at Adobe Research and the Fields Institute of Mathematics. So today, Sylvia will tell us about uncertain surface reconstruction. So um, I will pass the torch to Sylvia to tell us more. Thank you. All right, so if we tested this right, it should... Yeah, good. Work? Okay, good. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thanks for the nice introduction. It really is an honor to be invited here. Uh, I work, I, I was glad that when Ellen was introducing me, you, you said this was a series for computational imaging and related fields, because uh, uh, I was a bit, I felt a little bit of imposter syndrome talking about computational imaging. So I'm going to talk about a related field today. Um, so that's why I use this very pretentious title for today's talk, which is about geometry, which is what I do. I'm a very curious person, so I tried to find whatever was common to research that I've done, and I settled on geometry. So that's that's what I'm going to tell you about. I'm going to start by introducing myself, showing you what this uh, geometry is, um, what I what the kind of works I've done, and then I'm going to go into depth into one about 3D scanning and uncertainty quantification that might be more similar to things that you're used about hearing in this lecture series. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about my plans for the future. Um, so I, I broadly, the fields that ties my work together is geometry, which I can define as how to capture shapes, how to store them, how to study them, how to transform them. And um, especially at the beginning of my PhD, I work on fundamental geometric problems. Um, let's see what I mean by that. So uh, I'm going to give you a few examples of that. Uh, for example, this project that I worked on with Norm Eigerman at Adobe Research and my PhD advisor, Alec Jacobson, is what I call a fundamental geometric problem. I can state it like this. Uh, imagine an object, so some geometry, that is moving through space following a trajectory. So the input to this problem is purely geometry, an object and a trajectory. The question is, what is the region of space that is covered by this object as it moves? So you can imagine this object as a brush. What would be the brush stroke that this object leaves in space as it moves? This is called the sweat volume of the shape. And it's also geometry. So this is a problem that has geometry as input, geometry as output. That's why I call it a fundamental geometry problem. And in this work, we propose a way of computing it that's better and faster than previous work. and Importantly, it's robust enough to be used for more complex geometries like spaceship navigation, navigation uh, in this example. Uh, this is a mathematically fascinating problem, which also has many applications. I, I encourage you to read the paper. This sounds interesting to you. Uh, one cool application of this work is that you may want to compute this sweat volume to detect whether a path will collide with an obstacle or not. So if you're considering some path like this spaceship, 
you might want to compute the sweat volume and then see if it intersects with something. And if that, if that sweat volume intersects, that means that it's going to crash against an obstacle and you should try another trajectory. So anyway, that's one kind of fundamental problem, a geometric problem that I've worked on. Um, I thought I'd show you another one. So this is a joint work with uh, Jacob Kasten, Yan Sheng An, and my advisor, Alec Jacobson. The question in this, in this work is another fundamental geometric problem, which is, say we have an input shape and we want to smooth it in a way that we smooth only the concave parts of a shape while maintaining the exact same shape in the convex regions, right? So mathematically, it's an easy problem to state, but it turns out to be a very rich mathematical problem. Uh, you might be wondering, why would I want to smooth something only in the concave regions? Well, one reason you might want to do this is to simulate how dirt or rust accumulates on something, right? Rust will, or dirt will only accumulate in concave regions where it doesn't fall away. Uh, so this is, so if we smooth it with our method and paint the parts that we smooth, we can easily simulate rust, for example, for uh, to use this shape in a video game or a movie. Another reason you might want to do this is to simplify shapes. Um, you by, by, by smoothing only the concave regions outward, you get a cage of a shape that strictly contains it, which means that you can then use that cage to test things like collisions. You might have played a video game where you know that uh, to test whether two things collide, you sometimes use a hitbox. This is kind of like a fancier hitbox that you can compute using this method. So anyway, those are two fundamental geometry problems. Uh, geometry in, geometry out. We use classic geometric tools to solve those problems uh, that I've worked on. But lately, I've been moving slowly away from these sorts of problems uh, and into something that I like to call geometry plus. Now, ge Geometry Plus is not uh, the newest subscription service where you pay $10 a month and we send you a triangle uh, in the mail or something like that. It is much more simpler than that. That's, that's just branding. Um, it, it literally means adding Geometry Plus something else. So combining geometry with other fields to open the door to new problems and new solutions that are greater to the, than the sum of its parts. So ideally, new problems and new solutions that just by looking at geometry or just by looking at the other field, you couldn't conceive of them or you conceive of how to solve them, but we need to look at them together. So that's why I was very excited to get an invitation to talk at a plus area, which is computational imaging. But I'm gonna give you some examples of these geometry plus types of projects that I've worked on uh, to see a prototypical example. Uh, I'd encourage you to consider this work. In this work, we bring a new perspective to a classic geometry problem by looking at it from the lens of signal processing. So this is a work again with Noam Agerman and Alec Jacobs. And, and uh, the three of us were reading about this concept called compressed sensing, which might be very uh, familiar to some of you. Uh, to us as geometry people, we had never heard about this. The idea in compressed sensing, and I might butcher it, but uh, the way I understand it is you want to sample a signal. So like an image or an audio signal or whatever, you want to sample a signal such that you learn the, the dominant features of that signal, but using the least amount of samples. That's basically how I understand compressed sensing. So we thought, okay, what happens if we treat a surface as a signal? Well, a surface is hard to interpret as a signal, right? Because it's hard to understand, it's hard to say that, you know, a zero signal or a, a white image, what that, how, what, how that translates to a, zero surface or a white surface. So we gave this some more thought and we realized that we can actually treat derivative information about a surface as a signal. So for example, the second fundamental form of a surface can be interpreted as a signal and we use tool from compressed sensing to make to simplify the shape. And, I, and we simplify it in a specific way that makes it fabricable. So this, um, this first shape can't be made out of piece of uh, bent sheets of metal, for example, but this one can. So this one can be fabricated. And we solve this problem using uh, an insight from signal processing. So this is one example of this geometry plus vision that I'm trying to sell you on. Now, another example is this work. This is a work I'm particularly proud of, uh, where we look at existing algorithms from our field from the lens of algorithmic fairness. So this is, 
uh, a work that I did together with Anna Dodek from MIT and Professor Theodore Kim and Amanda Phillips, uh, where we surveyed the computer graphics literature. Uh, for example, algorithms that generate uh, geometries of the human body. And we studied how we currently treat gender as an algorithmic variable and the harms and biases that we introduce by doing so. Now, this was a very interesting work that needed a lot of expertise in geometry and computer graphics, but it also needed a lot of expertise in uh, queer theory and gender and uh, algorithmic fairness. So it was important that we did this geometry plus vision where we teamed with other researchers and we learned from other fields to actually succeed in this work. Uh, another recent project I've worked on is this one, where we um, use geometry to tackle a classic problem from physical simulation, uh, which is how does something break when it receives an impact? This is a joint work with Jack Long, Leticia Matos da Silva, Adavind Ramakrishnan, Yushun Yang, and Alec Jacobson. In this work, we take inspiration from the well-studied vibration modes that you might have heard of in physics class. These are just... Uh, an object's most natural ways of deforming. This is kind of like the classic problem you would see with a string where you, how you define the cosine, uh, but generalized to more shapes. We use this and we define something that we call fracture modes, which are an object's most natural ways of breaking. Why would we want to do this? Well, these fracture modes can be pre-computed for a given shape, and we can use them since they form an orthonormal basis of all the ways that an object can break, for real-time fracture simulations. So when you know this spaceship crashes against an object on its face, it breaks in a different way than if it crashes on it, whoops, than if it crashes on its side, which is a and, and we're simulating different fractures in real time. You might have you might have wished for this whenever you play a video game where you, you break a crate, it always breaks into the same pieces. We're hopefully trying to solve that problem. Anyway, this was a very fun project to work on because. Watching things break is very fun. And uh, watching things break in a computer where you don't have to clean up after is even more fun. But there's you know something I noticed in this project is that there's an equally satisfying feeling to playing the gift backwards, you know, to seeing how something is put together. Um, and that's exactly what this latest work is about. So in this work, we explored applications of our fracture simulation algorithm for robotics and machine learning. Um, this was a, a joint work where we teamed up with students Yun Chun Chan and Zi Yi Wu, who are from our department's robotics group. Uh, they're directed by Professor Animesh Garg. And we use our fracture simulation from the previous project to construct a massive data set with over 1 million fractured objects. So we basically took 100, uh, sorry, 10,000 different objects and we simulated throwing them against the wall in a hundred different times each to get a million different broken objects. And well, of course that's fun, but why would you want to do that? Well, I, my work stops there, but this is, this is what Zi and Yunchun wanted because they then wanted to use that as a data set to train and benchmark fracture reassembly algorithms. So algorithms that look at pieces of things and try to put them together. That's what they wanted to use this data set for, which I thought was very poetic because we broke things to learn to put them back together, which is kind of what life is about if you think about it. Um, anyway, so that's it from that project. I've taken you on a tour of what I mean when I say geometry plus. Um, now I'm gonna go more into depth into this other project where we propose reframing a geometric, a classic geometric problem as a statistical learning one. And this is a joint work with my amazing advisor, Alec Jacobson. I didn't put his face up again because I assume you've gotten tired of seeing his face, but he's still as invested in, in this work as, as he was in the others. So let's look at, let's start with a simple question. Consider an oriented point cloud of a surface. This might be a, a format that you're familiar with or not. This is the usual output of a LiDAR scan or any type of uh, 3D scan. So an oriented point cloud, a bunch of points with some normal direction. And let's place an object like this car somewhere in the plane. The question is, does this car intersect the surface described by this point plan? Well, before we wrote the paper, the way we would have answered this question, and maybe the way that you would answer it right now, is let's use a surface reconstruction algorithm to convert this point cloud into a fully determined surface representation, and then see if the car intersects this surface. And 
let's try that. The most well-known surface reconstruction algorithm in computer graphics is called Poisson surface reconstruction. Basically, this is an algorithm that you might have heard of. In broad terms, it uses the point cloud to get a scalar field, something that looks like this, which is an implicit representation of the surface. This is a function that takes positive values outside the shape and negative values inside the shape. And then the zero level set of this scalar field is the reconstructed surface. Okay, so at least Poisson reconstruction lets us uh, give an answer to the question, right? Our car does not intersect this reconstructed surface. So thanks to Poisson reconstruction, we can at least formulate an answer. According to this algorithm by Kashi et al, the car does not intersect the surface. Okay, so we're done. Except that's a bit of a scary conclusion to reach, right? Just by looking at the point cloud, imagine you're the one in that car. Would you be so sure that you're not crashing into the surface? It's intuitive that there are many possible shapes that the surface could take. Sure, it could be exactly like the Poisson reconstruction one, but you know it could also be like this. It could be like this. It could look like this, like this, or even this, right? Surface reconstruction is an underdetermined problem. We're sampling something at a discrete set of points, and we want to interpolate it, uh, extrapolate it everywhere else. So there's probably an infinite set of possible surfaces. And Poisson surface reconstruction is only considering one of them. So in this work, we propose a way of formalizing this sort of intuitively probabilistic view of surface reconstruction in order to give more complete answers to critical queries like this. Now, this will not just be useful for collision detection, knowing if this car intersects the surface or not, but it will also aid in other queries like ray casting, point cloud repair, or next view planning, as I'll show you later. We'll achieve this by combining the Poisson reconstruction algorithm with insights from statistical learning theory. Specifically, we're going to combine it with the concept of a Gaussian process. So since we're going to combine these two things, I thought we could take a look at them one at a time. Let's start with the first one. Here's how I like to think of Poisson surface reconstruction. Um, I'm going to do a quick summary. It's a very interesting algorithm if you want to read about it, but I'm going to summarize it best I can. The input to Poisson surface reconstruction is an oriented point cloud. So mathematically, this is just a set of points and a set of vectors. From this point cloud, we start with what I call the interpolation step. This is uh, where we define a vector field for every point in space. So now instead of just a discrete set of vectors, I define a vector field that takes values that, that I can query anywhere in space. And ideally, this vector field interpolates the normal directions from the oriented point cloud. Now, this might seem like a lot of math, but all that this is doing is a weighted sum of the normal vectors in the point cloud, where there's some kernel that measures how close two points are, which makes sense because you want, you know, when you're interpolating, you want the points that are the closest to be the most involved. And it also depends on a per point estimation of sample density. You don't need to understand why we want this, but if you think about it, it makes sense. Um, really, all you need to understand here is that we get a vector field and this vector field we can easily write in a matrix form like this. Once we've defined this vector field everywhere that we can query anywhere in space, we then solve a partial differential equation. This is a Poisson equation, which is where the method the method's name comes from, to get a scalar field that is negative inside and positive outside, and that describes the surface. But that last bit isn't really what I care about today. What I care about is this equation. So the punchline of this talk is going to be that I'm going to interpret this equation as the mean of a Gaussian process. I'm going to show you that this step can be understood as a Gaussian process. Uh, we're going to we're going to talk about Gaussian processes for a bit, a bit, and we're going to reach exactly that same equation for the vector field. So let's talk about Gaussian processes. What is a Gaussian process? Well, in a way that's trendy and, we get, and we'll get you uh, venture capital money today, a Gaussian process is doing supervised learning. But I didn't really know what that meant when I started working on this project. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you through what a Gaussian process really means. Basically, it means that there's some function u of x that I don't know, and I want to know what this function looks like. The first step of a Gaussian process is to come up with a prior. 
uh, this is what knowledge do I have about this function before I see any data. Now I, I work with I work better with examples, so I like to think of some function that uh, that serves as an example for this. The one I like to use is how long will my advisor take to respond to an email? That's the that's you and X is the time of the day at which I send the email, right? So, you know, let's say you've never sent your advisor an email yet. You're a new student. Surely you have some prior on how long that would take, right? So if you email your advisor in the middle of the night, that'll take longer than if you email them, uh, you know, at 2 p.m. in the middle of the day, right? And maybe you know that they are a morning person. So if you email them at 8 p.m., you're probably waiting until the next day, right? So you have some prior knowledge, but you have actually never tried it. So that's the first step of a Gaussian process. What do you know about this function? Or what do you guess about this function before you, you see any data? Then the next step is data observation. So you send your advisor a bunch of emails, or I send my advisor a bunch of emails at different times of the day and I log how long it takes for him to respond, right? So, you know, I send an email at 9 a.m., it took five hours, but I sent him one at 3 p.m. and he responded in five minutes. So I log all these things and I plot these in this graph, right? So these are pairs X, I, U, I of data observations. Well, the powerful thing about a Gaussian process is that once we've observed this data, it lets us, it lets us compute a posterior distribution. It lets us ask, what is what what does you look like at a new point that I have not tested? So you know, imagine I email my advisor at 9 a.m. and at 3 p.m. What happens if I email him at noon, right? Well, the powerfulness of a Gaussian process is that it it doesn't just tell us a guess for how long it will take him to respond at noon. It also tells us a variance, so a measure of confidence of how sure is the Gaussian process of how long it would take. Because it's different if you tell me it'll take him an hour. It's different than if you tell me it'll take him an hour plus minus 10 hours, right? That's a completely different measure. And this mean and this variance respond to some very simple algebraic uh, equations. So just multiplying some matrices around. So that's a Gaussian process. They're used for many things. There are many variations of them. But they all look like that. There's some prior that's in terms of these two functions that I'm not going to uh, really delve into what they mean. Then they observe some training data. And then they compute the posterior distributions of the function after seeing the data that respond to some mean and some variance that are respond to some closed form equation. Now, one common simplification that's usually done in Gaussian processes is to assume that the mean is 0. Now, this is not, this might seem a bit counterintuitive. I wish that my advisor took zero hours to respond to an email. That would be great, right? But my prior is not that he's going to take zero hours. So how could I assume that? Well, the idea is that you can always do a constant translation of a Gaussian process. So it's not that I would assume that it's zero. It's that I would assume that it's five plus that Gaussian process. So I can always tuck that, uh, that constant factor away. So for simplicity, we can assume that the mean is zero. So all that does is it simplifies this expression here into a much simpler matrix product. And these K matrices are obtained by evaluating uh, the covariance matrix of the prior, but you don't need to understand what that means yet. Now, another uh, simplification that we do is if you look at the expressions for the mean and the variance, it's immediate to see that the costly or the sketchy part of this computation is this matrix inversion, right? This is effectively solving a linear system. And I haven't told you what this matrix looks like. Maybe that's hard to do. Maybe it's expensive. Maybe it's uh, even non-robust. Maybe I can't do it very robustly. This is a matrix whose size is of the order of the data that I've observed. So it could theoretically be very big. So how am I doing this matrix solve? Well, I took a bit of a nuclear approach at this, uh, took a page from the finite element method uh, uh, book that, that I'm more familiar with, and I just did matrix lumping. So basically, I turned this K into the best fit diagonal matrix, which I, I has some 
justification, but you know, I'm happy to talk more about this step and how much you lose by doing this. But effectively, we turn it into a diagonal matrix. So solving a linear system with a diagonal matrix is trivial. So it's no longer a scary step. Uh, and mu and sigma, we can compute easily. By the way, finally, in this example, we considered a simple example where the function we want to learn is a scalar, right? How, how long does my advisor take to respond to an email? But I could just as easily have told you that this is a vector. So we could consider a vector valued Gaussian process. Okay, so this is where I wanted to get to, a vector valued Gaussian process with a zero mean prior and a lumped covariance matrix. Again, no need to understand a lot of the theory behind it. All, you, all I would like you to focus in is that as I promised, we reached this equation for the mean of the Gaussian process. Now this equation is the same as the equation for the Poisson reconstruction vector field. Now this is our major contribution. So I'll, I'll pause here briefly. We realize that the vector field that's described in Poisson surface reconstruction, which is an algorithm that we've been using in my field for 20 years now, can also be interpreted as the mean of a Gaussian process. Okay, so this is the observation. What do we do with it? Well, this lets us introduce our generalization of Poisson surface reconstruction, where we're gonna interpret it as if it was doing a Gaussian process from the start and see what extra information we get. So in this uh, stochastic Poisson surface reconstruction, as we call it, the input point cloud is no longer just a point cloud. It's a set of samples from a random distribution the interpolation step that one has in Poisson reconstruction is no longer an interpolation step. It's a Gaussian process with a given prior, um, with a given prior that describes this vector field. Now, instead of a vector field, we get a vector field posterior, a distribution that tells us what this vector field can look at at each point. So, you know, for each point in space, instead of a single vector, as in a traditional vector field, we have a set of possible vectors with different probabilities. So this is the new vector field posterior distribution that we can get thanks to interpreting this as a Gaussian process. Now, what about the next step in the algorithm where we solve a partial differential equation? Well, believe it or not, this is actually pretty simple to do. The same way that we solve a PDE in the space of functions, we can solve it in the space of distributions and get uh, we don't just get a scalar function, we get a whole posterior distribution for the Poisson reconstruction scalar field. What does this mean? It means that for every point in the plane, we have a mean and a variance, which determine a Gaussian distribution for what the scalar field looks like at that point. This distribution is not just ma uh, mathematically interesting, um, it's determined, fully determined by this mean and this variance. And if I, if I change the query point, the distribution will change too. A new mean and a new variance lead to a new distribution. As you might expect, if a point is very close to the point cloud, so if a point that is close to the data, it has smaller variances. Because we've observed data that is very close, so it makes sense that we're more sure of what the function looks like at that point. So we'll get a sharper distribution. But points that are far away from the data will have larger variances, which lead to more uncertain distribution. I don't actually know what the function looks like at this point. So it's not just mathematically interesting. This lets us compute important queries about different points in space. For example, we may want to compute this integral, which is nothing but the probability of the scalar field value being below or equal to zero. But remember what Poisson reconstruction was doing. It was giving us a scalar field that was positive outside, negative inside, and zero on the surface. So the function being negative just means, what is the probability that this point is inside the reconstructed surface? We can plot this quantity for every point to get something like this. And, and I'm gonna keep using these sort of 2D didactic examples because visualizing fields in 3D is hard, but we, everything I'm showing you, we can compute for more complicated 3D examples. 
The something we notice by looking at these probability functions is that it's easy to tell which ones represent shapes that we are more certain about and which ones don't. This is simple, right? If all values are zero or one, it means for every point, I'm 100% sure of, of if, it's, if it is inside or outside. So I perfectly know what the surface looks like. But the more the points there are that are closer to 0 0.5, the least certain I am of what the surface looks like. So inspired by this, we introduced this thing called integrated uncertainty, which just measures how far the probabilities are from 0 and 1 and converges as we sample more and more points on a given shaped surface. So we think this concept can be very useful, right? Because it measures, it's a, it's a shape agnostic value that measures the quality of a, of a shape reconstruction. So we can use it, for example, as a stopping criterion. You can progressively scan a shape and wait until the integrated uncertainty is lower than some threshold. And that way you can get surfaces of similar reconstruction quality using the same threshold value that's valid for all these surfaces. So that's one thing we can do with this statistical formalism. There are many other things. So another query that we can answer is, where does a ray intersect the surface, right? This is a very popular query with all the nerf related works that we've seen before. Um, given there's many possible surfaces, you, pro you're, you can probably imagine that the answer to this question or, of where does a ray hit the surface um, is not just one value of time or distance, it's a whole distribution of possible collisions along the, along the ray. But in principle, this distribution can seem very hard or even impossible to compute. However, we introduced a way of doing this thanks to these probabilities of each point being inside the shape that we computed. Indeed, we can interpret these probabilities as the differential probability of a ray terminating, right? So, you know, if this is a probability that there is something there, uh, you can interpret that as the probability of a ray colliding with something there, which is the same as a ray terminating there. So you can use this, and uh, this might surprise the computer graphics people in, this, in the audience less, but basically this gives you something called the transmittance that tells you the probability of a ray reaching time t without uh, colliding with anything, which you can sample from to get exactly that collision probability. So basically we use tricks from volume rendering that are more common in computer graphics to get this uh, collision probabilities along the ray. Okay, so this might seem more like a, a didactic mathematical example, but we, we can do it for more complex 3D shapes. For example, this spaceship where we simulate a point cloud of it, and we simulate the point cloud such that there's one side of the spaceship where we are very certain of what it looks like, and the, but we're, we're not sampling the other side a lot. And uh, if we place two hypothetical cameras, one on each side, and we simulate the rays from those cameras, we can see that the spread of where the rays may hit the surface is wider for the camera that's aimed at the region with less data points than the camera that's directly aimed at the data, which is what you intuitively would expect, but now we can validate it with our statistical formalism. Okay, so why would you wanna do this? And especially, why would you wanna do this and the previous quantity I showed you about the integrated uncertainty? Well, this is combined, these are very useful queries uh, because we can use them to plan the next best scanning position given a partial scan. So for a given point cloud, we can place many hypothetical cameras around it. For each camera, we can simulate new rays that hit the surface, use the method I just show you to compute where they may intersect the surface. And then we can ask, Assuming that they intersect the surface there and I get new surface points, how much would the integrated uncertainty decrease? So how better would my scanning get if I scanned from this camera? And this lets us score cameras by how useful they would be as the next scanning position. So this is a lot of things we can get, useful information we can get just from that statistical formalism that would have been impossible just from uh, the the naive Poisson reconstruction output. There are other statistical queries we can ask. So for example, we've seen how useful it is to compute a point's likelihood of being inside the shape, but we can also compute this quantity, which measures how likely it is to be 
on the surface of the shape. Uh, plot it for every point in, in the plane. It looks something like this. So it's a, a nuanced difference from the previous one. And this quantity is useful in many cases. I, uh, I think probably the best use is to use it as a sampling criterion. So a lot of these new learning algorithms might not know exactly whether, where the surface is yet, but they may want to sample more near the surface. I think that's a powerful application, but unfortunately I, I didn't think of this in time. So I'm gonna show you a, a different application that I thought I would pitch, which is point cloud repair. So if you have an incomplete point cloud of an object, we can use these probabilities as, uh, as distributions to sample for and fill in the point cloud in the, in the parts that are missing. And you might be thinking, what about the car, right? Well, I also haven't forgotten about the car. What about it? Well, another quantity that we can compute is regional probabilities. This is to say, given an input point cloud, we may not only care about single, you know, dimension zero points in space, what their probability of being in the shape is. We can draw whole regions of space and ask, what is their probability of intersecting the reconstructed shape? And we can use those probabilities for collision detection. So in this example, I, I constructed this very simple street scene that a car is traversing through. And using our algorithm, you can uh, scan your surroundings and find what the car's probability of crashing against other cars is along a proposed trajectory. Now, these are all applications that our stochastic boson surface reconstruction makes possible. Uh, but you might have heard this thing about um, famous actors that they do one movie for them, one movie for you, you know, like they will do one movie, one Avengers movie that sells a lot just so that they can fund the independent movie that they really want to make because they really like, right? So um, uh, drawing an analogy with that, these are the examples I made for them. Now I'm going to tell you about the, the application I'm really excited by. So this is the application that I did for me. So. If you recall, we, our contribution was reinterpreting Poisson reconstruction, showing it that it can be understood as a Gaussian process with a given prior. Now, I say we can dare to dream now that we've done this reinterpretation, not only about generalizing Poisson reconstruction or reinterpreting, but doing better than Poisson surface reconstruction now that we understand it differently. So for example, a known problem with Poisson surface reconstruction is that it may produce open surfaces. In our paper, we show that changing the prior in the reconstruction to that of a sphere, for example, we enforce closed surfaces in the reconstruction. But this problem of Poisson reconstruction giving you open surfaces is something that whole papers have been written about. But with this new interpretation, it's a change in one line of code to enforce that you will always get a closed surface in the reconstruction. Now, this doesn't just work for simple 2D examples. It will also work for simple 3D examples. So, you know, if you look at this apple, we simulate a point cloud scan. Uh, Poisson reconstruction gives us something like this, um, which doesn't look like an apple at all. Uh, it doesn't look like a feasible surface at all. It, my husband says this looks like the plant versus zombies uh, evil characters. If, once you see that, you can't unsee it. So I have to say it every time I show this picture. Uh, but if we use our algorithm, we get an apple. So that's uh, an improvement already. And uh, all right, an apple is a very simple shape, uh, even if it's useful sometimes. But even slightly more complex priors can work for more complex examples. Like we can use a we can add an ellipsoidal prior to a car reconstruction to get it much closer to the ground truth. So we are excited for future work that may build on this and use our new understanding to incorporate more complex task-specific learned priors to Poisson surface reconstruction. Now, another avenue that's a little boring for future work, but I think can be exciting is improving the algorithm's runtime. So while well, computing the mean of our distribution can be done very efficiently, computing the variance is quite slow. And we show a trick in the paper where we take this various computation from very slow to just slow, uh, which, is not very satisfying, but at least it means that we can have examples in our paper. But if you look at the shape of this variance, you're surely thinking this can't be hard to approximate. This doesn't look like a very complicated function, does it? So we hope that 
we, we think there's a very immediate avenue for future work where we can approximate or calculate these variances fast and use our work to provide all the statistical formalism. Anyway, another avenue for future work. Uh, this is more like a question that I get every time I talk about this project. So, you know, when you get asked a question and you don't know the answer to it, you kind of look bad. Uh, but if you if you take that question and you put it into the talk and you say that it's an interesting question for future work, you completely turn it around and suddenly you're the smart one, right? So I'm using this strategy. I always get the question of, well, can't you just do all of this with machine learning, right? Can you just do this with a neural network? And my understanding of neural networks is limited, but I've been looking into these things called Bayesian neural networks that seem to produce at least a similar variance map to the ones that we output. And I think replicating our work within the wider generality of these Bayesian neural networks uh, can have theoretical and practical benefits. Although I, I've been thinking about this more and I think our work also has some benefits over Bayesian neural networks. So anyway, this is a conversation I could have later, but uh, I think this exploiting this relationship is also a nice avenue for future work. At a higher level in this work, we combine geometry with the statistical learning field of uncertainty quantification. And I think this is a very promising combination and uh, a, a fully uncertain geometry processing pipeline that incorporates this uncertainty at every step is something I wanna pursue in the next few years. And there are already some works that do this and quantifying uncertainty in geometry processing, but like ours, they're more limited to the capturing step. So they work with point clouds and things like that. I think a very promising avenue for future work is to carry that uncertainty all through the geometry processing pipeline in a way that can also provide feedback for the capture process. Um, and I realize that vision sounds a little bit like science fiction right now, but I hope, I really hope works like ours can be a first step into making it a reality. And one of the reasons I'm excited to be here talking to people from a slightly different area is that um, I'd like you to work with me to do these further steps. So I wanna make this into an invitation. Uh, reach out to me if this sounds interesting. Specifically, uh, I, I've been looking into the computer vision literature lately and the computational imaging literature. And it seems like there's a lot of works that usually go from a real world scene to some point cloud or depth scan with some uncertainty quantification. I feel like that's something that people in these fields are accustomed to doing, whereas we in computer graphics usually treat point clouds as these very fixed certain inputs and we get the uncertainty from them. Um, I think what I'm proposing that we do together, if you're interested, is join these two pipelines, draw an arrow between them so that we can carry the uncertainty from one field into computer the computer graphics. Um, pipelines. So just turn these two pipelines that we're independently developing into a single one. So anyway, I hope with this, you're convinced about this geometry plus vision that I'm sharing. And if the if any of these projects that I have pitched or any of the things that have said have inspired you, you can find my contact information on this website. Um, and I'm more than happy to talk.